A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 9th of November 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. So before getting into the news article discussion, I have an important announcement for you. It is regarding our pre-storming test series. See the pre-storming test series is going to start on 22nd November 2023. The orientation for the test will begin a week ago. That is all. 16th November 2023. The admissions are open for the test batch. The series will cover 48 tests. So what are you waiting for? Just get enrolled and check your progress through the pre-storming test series of Shankar IAS Academy. So with this positive note, let us move on to the news article discussion. This news article talks about the tax devolution authorized by the union government to the states. This devolution was based on the 15th Finance Commission recommendation. Remember, the taxes will be devolved in 14 installments among states in a year. This is the crux of the news article given here. So in this news article discussion, we shall see what is tax devolution and some of the key recommendations of 15th Finance Commission. So it is a very important topic. It can be asked both in the prelims and mains. Okay. So what is tax devolution? Generally, tax devolution means a distribution of tax revenues between various units of government. That is both central government and the state government. Remember, it is a constitutional mechanism under Article 280 to allocate the proceeds of tax revenues between union and the state in a fair and equitable manner. So, it is a corner stone of fiscal federalism. Remember, there are two types of devolution. They are vertical devolution and horizontal devolution. Vertical devolution means the devolution of taxes between union and the states. And horizontal devolution means the allocation of taxes between the states. Indian Constitution under Article 280 Clause 3A mandates that the Finance Commission should make recommendations regarding the division of net proceeds of taxes between the union and the states. So this basic understanding, now let's move on to the key recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission. Firstly, with respect to vertical devolution, the 15th Finance Commission recommended the share of state in the central taxes for the 2021 to 26 period will be 41 percentage. Know that this is lesser than 42 percentage recommended by the 14th Finance Commission. This adjustment of 1 percentage is to provide resources for the newly formed union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh for, from the resources of the central government. Secondly, with respect to horizontal devolution, see the 15th Finance Commission recommended the allocation amongst the states based on the various weightages. For example, for income distance, 45 percentage, for population, according to 2011 census, 15 percentage, area, 15 percentage, forest and ecology, 10 percentage, demographic performance, 12.5 percentage, and tax effort. 2.5 percentage see remember all the six items very very important and remember for which item more weightage is given okay it is very important it will be asked in prelims question thirdly with respect to various grants which are given to the states know that 17 states will receive grants worth of 2.9 lakh crore rupees to eliminate revenue deficit so this is regarding the revenue deficit grants now moving on to sector specific grants. See sector specific grants of rupees 1.3 lakh crore will be given to states for 8 sectors which includes health, school education, implementation of agriculture reforms and etc. Moreover there is also a provision for state specific grants and the 15th finance commission had recommended the state specific grant of 49,599 crore rupees to the states to work in the areas like social needs, administrative governance and infrastructure, water and sanitation and etc. Finally, grants which are given to local bodies include the total grants of 4.36 lakh crore rupees which includes 2.4 lakh crore rupees for rural local bodies, 1.2 lakh crore rupees for urban local bodies, 70,051 crore rupees for health grants through local governments. Finally, with respect to disaster management funds, 15th Finance Commission 
has recommended the existing cost sharing patterns between the center and the state to continue between them. Know that the existing cost sharing pattern between center and state is that 90 is to 10 for North, East and Himalayan states and 75 is to 25 for all other states. The 15th Finance Commission say that the state disaster management funds will have a corpus of 1.6 lakh crore rupees and the center will have a corpus of 1.2 lakh crore rupees. So these are all some of the key recommendations of 15th Finance Commission. Make note of all the points, very very important. So these learn to points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this text and context article. This article talks about the importance of loss and damage fund. So first we shall see what is loss and damage and then we shall see what is loss and damage fund. So what is loss and damage? See according to IPCC, the term loss and damages refers to the adverse impacts of climate change. This includes extreme events resulting in economic damages, destruction of biodiversity, loss of lives and etc. These events happen particularly in developing countries that are most vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. Note that LND is destructive, irreversible and cannot be addressed by mitigation and adaptation measures of the world. So this is what the word loss and damage mean. Now what is this loss and damage fund? See LND fund refers to the cost that rich and developing countries should pay to the poor countries. This is because rich countries are primarily responsible for historical emissions that polluted the environment. However, the poorer nations made negligible contribution to pollution but are more vulnerable to extreme climate events. So the cost paid for the loss and damages of the poor nations by the rich nations is called loss and damage fund. Now let us see the timeline of establishment of loss and damage fund. See the least developed countries group LDC has previously demanded to establish accountability and compensation for loss and destruction which they are facing due to climate change. In pursuing this, LND was brought up as a demand in 1991 by the island countries of Vanuatu, which was representing the alliance of small island states AOSIS. Moreover, this has been discussed for a long time since the establishment of UNFCCC. Later, at the 19th Conference of Parties COP to the UNFCCC in Warsaw, Poland, in 2013, member countries formally agreed to establish the LND fund. It was created to provide financial and technical assistance to economically developing countries that are facing LND due to the adverse impact of climate change. Later at COP25, the Santiago Network for LND was set up, but countries did not commit any funds. Subsequently, at COP26, the Glasgow Dialogue on Finance for LND was established. Its aim is to continue discussion over the next three years on the fund. Finally, at the historic COP27 summit, which was held in Shram El Sheikh in Egypt, member states established LND fund. However, a transitional committee has been set up to figure out how the new funding mechanism under the fund would function. It would also make recommendations that would be discussed in COP28 Dubai summit. So here comes the question who will be funding the LND funds. See the fund will initially derive contributions from developed countries and other private sources like international financial institutions. But according to the final text of COP27, the nations that are both high polluting and considered developing under the criteria should also pay into the fund. It means that developing countries with negligible historical emissions like India, China should also contribute to the fund. This is particularly opposed by India as it demands historical responsibility and polluter pay principle. So this is about the discussion regarding loss and damage fund. This year's COP28 will be taking place from 30th November to 12th December in Dubai. 
of United Arab Emirates UAE so we'll see what is going to happen in the conference okay so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article it talks about the corruption allegations of the ruling party in Madhya Pradesh these allegations were charged by the opposition leader of Madhya Pradesh now the issue here is not very important but studying about corruption is very important in our exam perspective so in today's discussion we shall see some of the measures taken by Indian government to combat corruption firstly we shall see some of the legislative measures see the prevention of Corruption Act 1988 is a primary weapon to punish the corrupt officials. According to this act, if a public servant takes gratification other than his legal remuneration, then he or she will face minimum imprisonment of 6 months to maximum punishment of 5 years and a fine. Government in 2018 further enhanced the fines and it also criminalized both bribe taking and bribe giving. Now the second important legislative measure is the Right to Information Act, RTI 2005. So it is a watershed act to provide transparency and accountability in governance. This act empowers citizens to seek information from public authorities. Know that it provides for the disclosure of various information related to the functioning of the government and its various departments. The implementation of the RTA Act has made various information related to the working of the government as public and it unearthen various corruption scams. Now the third important legislative measure is the Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. See PMLA aims to prevent money laundering activities. Remember often the corrupt money is laundered through various activities like round tripping, Benami transaction and etc. So this act provides for confiscation of such a property. Apart from this, the Lok Ayakta and Lokpal Act of 2013, this act appoints an independent authority Lokpal at center and Lok Ayakta at states to probe into the complaints of kickbacks, bribes and corruption by the public servants. Apart from this, there is a act called the Whistleblowers Protection Act 2014. It allows any person including a public servant to make a public interest disclosure before a competent authority. It is also called whistleblowing. This act prevents such whistleblowers from any further harm to them. So these are all some of the legislative measures. Now let us see the administrative measures. See first is the e-governance. The digitalization of a government services has reduced the minimal interference between state and citizens and thus preventing the incidences of bribery and corruption. For example, the introduction of faceless assessment of various income tax cases and appeals has reduced the interface between officials and citizens and thereby reducing the harassment of citizens at the hands of officials. Apart from this, the introduction of a direct benefit transfer. Jam Trinity comprehensively changed the service delivery system. They reduced the scope of corruption by depositing the money directly into the bank accounts. So these are all some of the important steps that are taken by the government to combat corruption. So these learned points and let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this opinion page article. It talks about the issue in EFIR. See, to register an EFIR, the police officer must obtain the physical signature of the complainant within three days. If the signature is not obtained, the EFIR is not registered and the information is deleted after two weeks. So the article here points out that some states in India are already registering EFIRs for property offences. The Law Commission recommends EFIRs to all cognizable offences where the accused is not known. So the article raises concerns about the need for human interaction, especially in cases where timely action is critical, like in kidnapping cases. The author suggests the use of e-authentication techniques or digital signatures to streamline the EFIR process and make it legally valid. This is the crux of the news article given here. So in this news article discussion, we shall understand 
டிஜிட்டலைசேஷன் ப்ராசஸ் இன் இந்தியா த்ரூ அ மெயின்ஸ் ஆன்சர் ரைட்டிங் அப்ரோச் பிஃபோர் தேட் யூ கேன் டேக் அ லுக் அட் த சிலபஸ் அண்ட் விச் திஸ் டாபிக் கேன் பி ஆஸ்ட் இன் த மெயின்ஸ் எக்ஸாமினேஷன் நவ் லெட் மீ ரீட் அவுட் த கொஷன் ஃபார் யூ த கொஷன் இஸ் வாட் இஸ் த ஸ்டேட்டஸ் ஆஃப் டிஜிட்டலைசேஷன் இன் த இந்தியன் எக்கனாமி Examine the problems faced in this regard and suggest improvements. See, the question is very straightforward. We have to explain the status of digitalization in the Indian economy. It means we should write about how much impact the digitalization created in economy and we must provide relevant data to support our argument. Then we have to list out few problems in digitalization process and in conclusion we have to suggest some steps to be taken to improve the digitalization in India. So this is how we have to write the question. Now let us see how to write the introduction. In the introduction you can write that digitalization means the increased use of digital technologies to transfer traditional economic activities process enhancing efficiency productivity and overall growth in this regard government of india launched the digital india program which aims to facilitate the delivery of government services through digital means and promote digital literacy you can write this in the introduction part for the question moving on to the main body of the answer So here we are going to divide the body of the answer into two parts. In the first part we are going to explain the status of digitalization in Indian economy and in the second part we are going to explain the problems in digitalization process. First we shall see the status of digitalization in the Indian economy. Here you can mention about Digital India campaign. See this has empowered citizens through digital technologies. For example, DigiLocker has simplified document access and sharing contributing to greater digital inclusion. It has over 15 crore registered users and 60 million monthly active engagements. Secondly, Aadhaar system. So it is the world's largest biometric ID platform with over 1.3 billion enrollments. Aadhaar also helps to provide services like direct benefit transfer DBT. Thirdly, unified payment interface in short called as UPI. UPI has revolutionized digital payment in India enabling seamless and real time money transfers the historic milestone of 10 billion monthly transaction in august 2023 emphasizes the widespread adoption of digital payment solution fourthly you can talk about gstn that is goods and services tax network the introduction of gstn simplified india's indirect tax system under this network tax compliance has become more structured and transparent at least 1.2 crore businesses are registered under gstn lastly smart city mission this mission envisions the development of 100 cities with advanced digital solutions for example pune's smart city project focuses on enhancing urban mobility and solid waste management through the application of digital technology aiming to improve the quality of life in urban areas so these developments imply india's commitment to digital transformation and the positive impacts of digitalization on various sectors now moving on we shall see some of the problems faced in digital transformation Firstly you can talk about the digital divide. See there is still a big gap between urban and rural side when it comes to digital infrastructure and access. Only about 50% of the population has an internet subscription indicating that a substantial portion of the population still lack access to the digital economy. Currently over 55000 villages remain deprived of mobile connectivity. Secondly cyber security issues the increasing reliance on digital platforms has elevated the risk of cyber attacks in 2020 india faced the second highest number of cyber attacks in the asia pacific region thirdly regulatory challenges recent issue with twitter and the indian government over regulatory compliance shows the lack of proper regulatory mechanism in digital platforms Fourthly you can write about infrastructure challenges say poor digital infrastructure including slow internet speeds and inconsistent connectivity in some areas affects the full potential of digitalization so these are all some of the problems 
associated with digitalization of Indian economy. So in the conclusion part, you can suggest some measures that can be taken to improve the digitalization process. Firstly, you can write that government should increase investment in digital infrastructure. Then there should be active collaboration between government, private sector and academia in promoting digital services. Thirdly, the government must create policies to address data privacy and security issues. Finally, steps should be taken to boost digital literacy, especially in rural areas through awareness campaigns. So in summary, India's digital transformation has majorly contributed towards economic growth. We must address digital literacy, infrastructure and data privacy to ensure complete digitalization. So that's all regarding this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw in detail about what is digitalization. We saw some of the positive aspects of digitalization and we also saw some of the issues associated with it. And in the conclusion, we saw some of the suggestions that can be taken to improve the digitalization process of India. So these learned points and now let us move on to the next news article discussion. According to the news article, the Election Commission of India is holding a conference in Chennai to assess the readiness for the 2024 general election. Chief electoral officers and police nodal officers from all southern states will participate in the conference. This is about the news article given here. So in this context, let us revise some of the basics about Election Commission of India, ECI. So Election Commission is a constitutional body. This is because it is directly established by the Constitution of India under Article 324. So what is the purpose of Election Commission? The purpose of the Election Commission is to ensure free and fair election in the country. So the Election Commission is responsible for the election of Parliament, State Legislature, the Office of President and Vice President of India. So we can say that the Election Commission is an all India body as it is common to both central government and state governments. Talking about its composition, see the Election Commission of India was a single member body when it was established in the year 1950. Later in the year 1989, the Election Commission transformed into a multiple member body. Article 324 says that the Election Commission shall consist of the Chief Election Commissioner and such members of other Election Commissioners as fixed by the President. That is, the election commission consists of a chief election commissioner and other election commissioners. They are appointed by the president of India. Talking about their tenure, the chief election commissioner and other election commissioners have a tenure of 6 years or up to the age of 65 years, whichever is earlier. Remember, to ensure the independence of election commission, Article 324 contains the following provision. Firstly, the tenure of the Chief Election Commissioner is secured. This is because the Chief Election Commissioner can only be removed by the Parliament through impeachment. To make it clear, the CEC can be removed by the President on the basis of a resolution passed in the Parliament. Secondly, when we look into the service condition of the Chief Election Commissioner, it cannot be varied to his disadvantage after his appointment. Another important thing you should note here is that the other election commissioners or regional commissioners cannot be removed from the office except on the recommendation of the chief election commissioner. So this is how the constitution secures independence of election commission of India. So these learned points and let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion. Look at this first question about 15th Finance Commission. Three statements are given and you have to find how many statements are incorrect here. Look at this first statement. Income distance has the biggest weightage among the criteria for devolution to the states. This statement is correct. Look at the second statement. It has recommended performance based grants and sector specific grants. This statement is also correct. Now look at this third statement. The 15th Finance Commission has increased the share of states in the divisible pool of central taxes by 1 percentage. This statement is incorrect because it has reduced the share of taxes by 1 percentage. So the correct answer here is option A only 1 because only one statement is incorrect other two statements are correct. Moving on who of the following is not a member of the committee that recommends the appointment of the Central Vigilance Commission. The correct answer for this question is option D speaker of the Lok Sabha. 
moving on look at this question about a loss and a damage fund three statements are given and you have to find how many statements given here is or are correct look at this first statement it works on the area of adaptation to climate change activities this statement is completely wrong it is a fund to compensate for the loss due to climate change look at this second statement the donation of the fund will be from government sources only this statement is also incorrect private and multilateral institutions can also donate to the fund look at the third statement it was established during cop 27 summit in egypt this statement is correct so the correct answer for this question is option a only one because others two statements are incorrect here with this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel now thank you so much for listening